The increased use of opioid pain medications has been mirrored by an increase in misuse and abuse of these drugs. Abuse deterrent formulations, or ADFs, were designed to address the tampering with pain drugs that might be manipulated, resulting in easy misuse or abuse. Balancing the needs of pain treatment with abuse prevention can be challenging. Let's review how the FDA requirements for abuse deterrent formulations have changed in recent years. So to my panel, has this changed recently? Is there more action needed by our regulators or the government regarding these abuse deterrent formulations, Charles? So um, absolutely, but I don't think, first of all, I mean, uh, abuse deterrent preparations are one step in helping to curb abuse and misuse and the devastating outcomes that can occur when the wrong person is using the medication at the wrong dose and so on. But I think, and the FDA has done a lot um, it, uh, to its credit to outline how a pharmaceutical company could develop a abuse deterrent preparation. And so it's really set forth in a white paper, how, how, how do you get this designation? But there's no requirement upon the payer right now to do what's in the best interest of the person whose care they are paying for. And so I think there's a huge disconnect still out there between what is available. There are abuse deterrent medications available. They're not being used enough because in part, I believe, they're not being covered, so to speak, quote unquote, covered by the insurance company has no medical legal requirement that I'm aware of to do what's safest for that person, which is disgusting, and the patient doesn't know that they may be able to avail themselves of a better approach, and too many of our colleagues think, well, my patient doesn't need that approach. It's not happening to him. I'm, my patient isn't abusing things. So there are a variety of things that are starting to churn. You know, Joe, you and I have talked about this in the past. I mean, the majority, the overwhelming majority, almost all of the opioids that we prescribe don't have abuse deterrent formulations. 95% of the uh, opioids, extended release opioids are generic and they do not have ADF type preparations. 100% of the opioids that are covered by CMS as first line treatment are non-ADF from my knowledge. And on top of that, some of the insurers are telling individuals who may not be as skilled in the knowledge of extended release opioids to start patients on agents like methadone as a starting <laughs> agent, which, you know, even in the hands of an individual skilled in the trade, it's, it, we need a certain amount of interpersonal variability, right, Charlie? But, but is it, but isn't, you know, when you talk about CDC statistics about overdo un unintentional overdose and deaths, isn't methadone, which is maybe 2%, 3% of the prescribed opiate, responsible for 30 or 40% of those? So again, disconnect. Yeah, big disconnect. So I think, you know, what other actions are needed? I think we need to get the stakeholders involved. I think Charlie appropriately brought that up. I think the FDA, DEA, and other state medical uh, licensing boards are doing their, or at least putting forward some ideas. I think that the insurers really, even though their fiduciary responsibility is to their stakeholders for profit, and it's I mean, not to address societal. They're yeah, shareholders. They're shareholders. That they're publicly traded. Shareholders, yeah. right. Uh, it, it, it still aligns with the responsibility, just like physicians have a responsibility to try to understand what, which patients may be at a high risk and then put action in place. I think it's their responsibility too. I think that if we look at the role of the manufacturers, this is almost like the seatbelt, right? That's where we are right now. And you know, reducing the speed limit, uh, you know, having a seatbelt, adding air brake, you know, uh, airbags, getting anti-like brakes, that's where we're headed when it comes to the technology that we can bring to it. But you have to have buy-in and you have to have access to technology, and I think that's what Charlie has highlighted appropriately. Yeah, I think uh, the, from what both of you are saying is it's not a, a, a one-step approach. This is not just create an abuse deterrent formulation and now there won't be any type of opioid abuse, right? These are incremental benefits to the medications that we have to, in hopes of deterring abuse. Chris, how long do you think it'll be before our country has no more pure mu opioid agonist, that every drug that we prescribe will have some abuse deterrent or tamper resistant technology? I see the timeline in, in the form of decades, Jeff, and I, don't, I do believe that the whole category can potentially be overrated. Uh, drug abusers in some way will always be drug abusers. They will seek and find ways to 
tamper with the tamper resistant technology and make it freely available become immediately available online. So whether if you go to YouTube or if you go to Opiophilia or Blue Light RU, um, it, this category is, not e is very easy to defeat to make them instant release and rapid acting. And also I think we need to ask ourselves, uh, what is the most common form of abuse? Um, that is swallowing whole pills at, a, at an amount greater than prescribed. And the abuse deterrent technologies do nothing to mitigate that. So I do think it's going to take decades, but I don't think the impact is going to be as much as we think it will be. Sure. You know, when you look at the efficacy of these drugs at reducing abuse, most of the studies, Charles, you talked about the, the FDA laying out a blueprint about how these studies should be done. They look at likability. And the study population they look at are recreational drug abusers. Now, that's different for us. We can't necessarily translate that into pain patients. Uh, Joe, what do you think about some of the research on, on ADFs that's coming out? Sure. I mean, I think we have to start somewhere. I think that if we look at the, uh, particularly the epidemiological studies in order to get the higher uh, category claims and tiers, I don't think we definitively know what they should look like, first of all. Uh, I think that, you know, currently right now, I only know of one product that actually has ADF in the label. I think all the rest of them may have technologies that might allow for this or potentially have the physical characteristics um, to allow for it. But the true impact is difficult. Even when we look at how we're coming up with some of these epidemiological markers, these are usually individuals who either have been, for reason of legal reasons, brought in for custody and now we're going to query them about what they've used and what they would not use, or they're individuals who want to stop abusing drugs and stop being addicted. And they really, I, from what I understand, only represent about maybe 3 to 5% of the total population that's abusing. So you could have selection bias. And I'm very concerned when we make these rapid statements that expand to, to pain patients as well, because pain patients are different than maybe what recreational abusers are. So e extrapolation between the data that we have related to addiction and recreational use and using it in an everyday practice is somewhat hard, but we have nothing else to go on. Sure. So, you know, the data does suggest that if you tamper with these formulations, you don't eliminate, but you limit the likability in the majority of patients or in the majority of abusers. Like we can't even call them patients because they haven't been studied in, they haven't been studied in patients. Um, so we do have, as you mentioned, Joe, at least one that has in the label, maybe two in the label, a short acting and, a, and an extended release, and a number of others that have these putative benefits of uh, combining with an opioid antagonist so that if the preparation is crushed, it's released and limits the likability. Aversive, or cost, aversive uh, technology. There's aversive technologies, uh, technologies for sure. Uh, Charles, you brought up some of the challenges before in trying to prescribe these, these agents. Uh, do you see that getting easier over time? I think that it will get easier over time um, because I think that it'll become more and more difficult. It, it would become more and more difficult for the payers to ignore the realities. I respectfully disagree to a certain extent with one of Joe's comments um, about separating the recreational drug abusers from the patient, people who we take care of. Because there's an overlap, there's a huge, you know, there's an overlap between we don't know when a person comes in. They don't generally say, hey, Dr. Gooden, just want you to know I'm a drug addict or I'm a recreational drug abuser. We don't know. And some people don't even know what their inherent tendency towards how they would behave towards a drug that they're prescribed. You know, many people discover this aspect of their own behavior only when they're given an opiate for the first time following a simple procedure. So I think you know, we don't always know that the recreational drug abusers aren't the ones that are going to be winding up in our practice as well. Um, I do think that it, we have to take um, every step possible, and if this is the seatbelt step, Joe, then this is the step that we have to take to do whatever we can. I think the fact that the FDA has released a, a blueprint and a white paper is a step in making it, putting, starting to put the, the screws on the payers, and I think if every state were to adopt standards and we put pressure um, on the payers to do what is, a, what, is, what is standard of medical care. If standard of medical care across society, across every medical practice situation is to use an abuse deterrent approach as a measure of the step 
as a first step in seat belts before airbags, we will save a lot more lives. And yes, people can still drive without seat belts, just like you mentioned, Chris, that people can still take more medicine. But to say that we shouldn't use what's available is crazy. Sure. I think ADFs provide a, a blanket form of non-discrimination against patients because you don't have an absolute biomarker to know who's going to become addicted or abused. Um, this is a good way to do it. And I think important, it addresses the secondary market. It doesn't really address, I mean, I think it addresses a certain amount of potential patients, and that's a good question that I don't think is answered. How many chronic pain patients actually become addicted or abused? I don't think anyone knows that exact number. We do know that 71% of the patients who, from the data we have, who are people, 71% of the people who report using opioids um, that are non-patients abusing them, that it comes from a family member, either purchased, stolen, or gifted to, from that person. So it's really that secondary market you're addressing as well. If you're making it less attractive for someone to seek that person's prescription that you're legitimately writing for them, then maybe that has a, an impact beyond the patient-doctor relationship, which we can't control for. You know, Joe, I'm glad you brought that up. I, you know, I was a big fan of this whole concept of abuse deterrent technologies. And I'll tell you what I found in practice. You try to write this agent, and you know, Charles already mentioned the managed care and the payer issues. I mean, that's a, that's a huge issue unto itself. But talk about the patient issues. The patient says to me, well, doc, I don't abuse my medicine. And uh, you know, I keep my medicine under lock and key. I, I don't, I'm not gonna pay more for this drug. Give me my old drug. That's the real patient. The abuser, who I don't, haven't yet uncovered, obviously says, Hey, Doc, I don't want this drug. I'm not an abuser. I'm not going to take it. So these are a class of drugs that look like they're going to benefit society, but patients don't want, and payers don't want, and abusers obviously don't want. So I think until we remedy this issue that the majority of opioids are pure mu agonists and don't have tamper-resistant or abuse deterrent features, uh, I think we're kind of in, in you know, uh, uh, stage one of this of this change and I'm hoping Chris that it doesn't take decades I mean we have a, a public health crisis on our hands I'm hoping this is a matter of years literally I have a, a, a quick comment and I would uh, like to ask the panel what I'm noticing when I'm, I start the patient on these medications and even if this, these medications are being approved by their health insurance there is a so-called opioid prescription fatigue which I see in the physicians to whom I'm hoping to transfer the patient's care. They tell me, this is the medicine that I'm not familiar with. If you'd like to prescribe it, be my guest and continue prescribing this uh, medication. And in spite of my uh, uh, forwarding evidence that these medications are safer than the old formulations, they're somewhat reluctant. I think.